Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Welcome this morning to the second day of the Urbanism Next conference. Um, my name is Amelia Brook, and I'm an urban planning researcher at the Technical University in Vienna, in Austria. And I will be your host for this morning's session titled Future Perspectives on Public Spaces. Before I will sketch out what you'll be able to expect for the next one and a half hours, I will briefly introduce you to some basic housekeeping rules that I was asked to share with you. On the right side of your screen, you see different tabs. We will be using especially the chat function and also the Q&A function. Chat um, is there for all general comments and also for our speakers. If you have um, links to share references, please post them in there. The Q&A tab is especially if you as listeners would like to pose a question that we can then uh, take into our discussion please do so through that function. Otherwise, um, just a request to be mindful of time when, when speaking, and then of course, um, please mute your microphone while you're not speaking. Um, after the session, there are a number of different functions that this, that this tool actually offers, and this is just a way for you to also be aware of, uh, of what you can actually use this for, networking, direct messaging, et cetera. So um, to start with our topic of the session, I would like to sort of set a general understanding of what we speak about and what we refer to when we mean public spaces. And I would like to actually use a very broad and um, wide understanding and definition that as that of the UN Habitat, which really sees public space as those spaces between buildings and also facilities that can consist of different types of urban spaces. That is on the one hand streets and pedestrian accesses that can be open and green spaces, but these can also be public facilities. And what we talk about when we, when we look into the future and our speakers will refer to that in different, from different angles is our mobility trends that currently put not only the mobility system in a transformative, um, uh, dynamic, but also our public spaces. Um, these trends contribute to the diversification of mobility options, particularly urban mobility options, but also they diversify the demand for public spaces. And perhaps one of the big differences in comparison to mobility transitions that we know of from the 20th century is that Today, we can think of what are the effects of public spaces in advance. So rather than um, bringing in this aspect of what are the urban implications, what are the implications for urban form, but are, and also public spaces reactively, and then sort of reflect, okay, how can we fix things? We can proactively address how new activities take place, what are the different forms of use, also social demands, functional demands that um, come about with new mobility options, but then also what are the different um, interests that are actually being embedded into public spaces due to new actors also being involved. So that brings me to our session speakers, and I'm really excited to be um, joined today by a variety of different guests that will um, share very different angles and very different perspectives on what the future of public spaces may hold. Um, we have on the one hand, Sabine Bawa, urban researcher and urbanist from the Technical University in Graz. We have Jakob Köhler from Lein, representing a micromobility provider. Um, we have Tess Tribos from the Rijkswaterstaat, which is the National Road Authority in the Netherlands. And we have my colleague Aglos Sotiropoulos, who's also a mobility expert and a, and a traffic modeling expert um, here at the Technical University in Vienna. So all of us will present a slightly different angle to the subject. And um, without further ado, I would like to actually hand over to Sabine now for her presentation. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you for the introduction. I will share my screen. Yes, you should be able to see my PowerPoint now. If not, I hope somebody will tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks again for the introduction and thank you for having me here. 
Um, I'm very happy to have the possibility to talk to you about the potential of mobility space to repair the city. The findings that I will share now are part of an article we wrote for uh, a publication that will be published this year in the US flag in Berlin called Die Stadt nach Corona. And I especially want to thank my co-authors Aglaide Gro and Markus Monsberger, as well as my helping colleagues Eva Schwab, Stefan Bendix and Jennifer Fauster, who helped um, writing this article. Maybe a little bit of background before I actually start. I'm part of the Institute of Urbanism at TU Graz. And um, also um, this institute is um, considering itself dedicated to the relationship between urban projects and the territory between, for linking people, um, environment and space, and especially emphasizing the interstitial space. What we do is we work with public spaces. And um, of course, we are, we are concerned with these trends that Emilia was pointing out, the trends affecting public spaces. And especially in the course of the last years, um, we were in the situation of the pandemic and have been asking ourselves how did the pandemic affect public spaces and how did it affect our demands, um, our spatial demands. And from our observations and studies, our findings were that the answer to this question is um, not much. <laughs> in, in fact, we found that these challenges and problems that public spaces are facing right now, they have been present already before the crisis. But what happened is that the, the COVID crisis, it's the kind of point the finger on these, um, on these challenges and highlight and accelerate it in some way. So, for example, the injustices in economic um, economic value in how um, money and wealth is um, is spread. These injustices that have been pointed out, for example, in this OECD report that said that during the last twenty years, housing prices have risen three times faster than the middle income middle class income average. These problems have been there for years, but now in the course of the pandemic, of course, if we have to stay within our apartments, we can even more feel how small and maybe not that um, how small they are, or maybe that they are not in that attractive that we want to have them in the surrounding that is not that attractive as we wish. But also uh, we know that we have little space to live and move in public spaces and the distribution of space is sometimes not um, not in our favor. This is even more visible if we want to keep a 1.5 meter distance between people in public space. So these challenges and problems have been there even before the crisis, but we thought and think that now that people and we all are aware of these problems even now, even more than before, it might be a good point to start something new and to change something like Winston Churchill said never waste a good crisis and in trying to do so we were reaching back to another publication called uh, Traffic Space is Public Space by Stefan Bendix and Agla Edeko where they were um, pointing out strategies to reclaim traffic spaces as public spaces and we th thought that the last four of these categories the participation, sharing of space, revitalization of local economy and metabolism have been specially affected by the pandemic. Of course, participation has decreased a lot, but we are very positive that it will be reinstalled as soon as we are able to meet each other again in person. But for the other three aspects, we are expecting kind of a structural and long term change. And this is where we were focusing on these three aspects. And to start just with the sharing of space, um, as I said before, we know that we do not have a distribution of space in public and especially traffic spaces that we wish for. But why is now a good time to start a change? Um, as we have experienced during the pandemic that especially public and, and come, um, and yes, public transport and uh, have been 
decreasing in use. Um, these mobilities were shifting towards individual modes of transport. And we think that now is a good time to enforce the development of increasing especially active forms of mobility because as we all know active mobility needs less space is less space intensive than um, car mobility so redirecting mobility flows to active forms of mobility actually is a good way to save space and make it free for other uses and there are many um, examples all over europe and the world that showed during the pandemic the development of pop-up bikeways, pop-up um, pedestrian zones and um, things like that. But there's one example that I want to share with you. And this is the example of the Brussels inner city district where the car speed was reduced to 20 kilometers per hour to make it more bike and, um, and also walking friendly. And I especially like this project because it was um, it is now planned to be a permanent solution and not only temporary so we'll just hop to the next um, part the question about so so socio-economic effects and of course if we talk about socio-economics and changes in this matter during the pandemic we also do have to talk about home office solution we know that home office solutions and also um, video conferencing tools that we are experiencing now have been increasing in use a lot. And um, often people think, and also I was actually expecting that it was um, cause a reduction in mobility as we do not have that much of commuters traffic, not that much directed traffic. But what actually happened is, and we can see it here on the right diagram with the dark yellow line, that indicates that other modes of tra uh, other travel um, purposes like leisure travel and um, indirect undirected mobility was actually increasing. So what happened is that this commuter traffic were kind of compensated by other travels. This brings us to the conclusion that if teleworking is to have an impact on mobility reduction it has to go hand in hand with the proximity city and we probably all of us have heard of the, the project in paris that has dedicated itself to become a 15 minute city a city where every daily needs are accessible within 15 minutes by walking or cycling in a decentralized structure structure but i want to show you another example the example of the lev burton project in flandern um, where the aim was to make a leap in the quality of design of public spaces in residential neighborhoods especially in sub and peri urban municipalities and i think these two examples have to go hand in hand because our decentralization of the city infrastructure um, in this time now also has to react on um, the challenges that we already have with problematic effects in sub and peri urban peri urbanization because now with teleworking solutions we have the possibility to disconnect our the, the space where we live from uh, the location of our of our workplace so the choice of residence is no longer made connected to the workspace but to where we want to live so what we need is attractive residential neighborhoods and the last point is the metabolism probably all of us have already um, experienced the positive um, effects for mental and physical health if we can move outside in the green and also inhale fresh air <laughs> and these facts were um, even stressed by some uh, findings again i have an example from from brussels here where the um, in the first lockdown the public health institute made a series of diagrams that showed on the one hand the number of COVID cases per district and on the other hand 
um, different indicators for housing qualities qualities as well as the housing qualities inside the houses but also um, outside and there is a relation between these two aspects meaning that in bad housing conditions and districts with not that much green and attractive outside spaces there's also more COVID cases registered than in others. So what we uh, can conclude from that is that the transformation of our public spaces and mobility spaces has to be part and go hand in hand with the ecologization of the city. And there is also one example that I want to show from the town where I live and work, from Graz. It is a project from city councillor Judith Schwentner, um, who started the project called the initiative called 17 green miles and wants to change at least one street in each district into a qualitative public space that is ecological and social sustainable so to conclude i think and we think that it's possible to exploit the potential of mobility spaces to repair the city through these three aspects through um, combining home-based work with development of active mobility modes and the development um, of proximity cities and that this will free up space that can help us to requalify the city to ecologize the city and through these developments our mobility spaces um, will be able to be part of a, of a solution of a way to repair our cities um, also for problems that have been have been here before the current crisis. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Sabina. This was a great presentation. I really, really appreciate the integrative approach of um, your study and also understanding how you really try to bring together the different dimensions, health, local economy, infrastructure mobility, to, to visualize how um, what we need to consider when we talk about the transformation. Could you say perhaps a little bit about what have been responses locally to these sort of bold visions of how to reclaim public spaces for more um, green, more sort of livable um, environments in Graz specifically? Um, in Graz, well, of course, I think it's more or less similar to, to many, many other cities, that these ideas, they are, um, they are more or less pushed forward and forced by also a political party, as in this case, uh, Die Grünen, the Green Party. And uh, so it's also part of a political discussion. So it's not only um, a matter of am I pro or con ecologization of the city, but also am a pro or con this political party. And I think this is, this is one of the difficulties in these developments that we are not having um, a discussion only that, that can in some way disconnect from political interests mm -hmm. and is also um, always connected to this. But, but in fact, um, well, yeah that's that's the situation we are dealing with but i think we need to really um, get to a perspective or a situation where we can talk about these these needs for structural changes mm. um, detached from also detached from political interest because it's something that that is um, necessary for all of us no mm. matter which party we we or which political direction we are interested um, right, or, and, or, yeah. and also which mobility mode we prefer. And of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the environmental crisis um, is said to be much more severe and will become much more severe in our in our daily lives than, than COVID is right now. So mm -hmm. I think we really need to get to this point where we can talk about these structural changes in a way that everybody is aware that they are needed and that we have to find a good solution yeah yeah perfect thank you very much um Thanks i'd like so to much. perhaps come back to that at the very end if we still have time to have a joint discussion with the panel um but for now i would give over hand over to jakob Köhler from lime 
and ask him to join us uh, here on our virtual stage and share his presentation. Thank you, Emilia. Yeah, my name is Jacob Köhler. Happy to be here today. Um, also, thank you for the intro. I'm from the micromobility provider Lime, working in public affairs in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Also, thank you for sharing my presentation. If we go to the, the next slide, just real quick on Lime. Um, we are a micromobility provider. Our goal is to, to create the platform for all electric trips under five miles. We want to establish a true alternative to the private car in partnership with public transit in the cities we operate in. Company was launched in 2017, and we so far served over 200 million rides in over 150 global markets. We are not a scooter company. We actually started out with bike sharing. And as you can see, we offer a range of micromobility options, including e-bikes and e-mopeds. Um, next slide, please. Quick on micromobility. Um, most trips taken by car today are really short. In fact, in Germany and in Austria, and I think that's true for globally, actually, a quarter of all trips taken daily are shorter than two kilometers long. So when we're talking about a platform for all trips under five miles, we're not targeting a niche. We're actually targeting the majority of trips taken by cars. And if trips are short, it begs the question, do you really need a car that weighs two tons to move, to move one human being across town? And we believe it don't, and there are better alternatives. Uh, if you go to the next slide. If you look at smaller vehicles, you also look at the space they take up. Embracing micromobility means less emissions and less congestion in cities, but it also means that we can think about the space that is today taken up by, by cars. And as you can see on the picture, the space occupied by a single car can, could host a bunch of scooters, many e-bikes, and even a few cargo bikes. And that car is probably standing there for 23 hours a day. Um, an interesting fact, the county of LA in the US is home to over 18 million car parking spaces which cover an area of over 500 square kilometers. So parking is really the issue of, of space and city. Um, and with more and more people moving to cities globally, we see this trend that more and more people move to cities globally. Parking becomes a real concern because cities don't want to make more space for more cars, for more people that move into their cities. If you go to the next slide. I want to touch quickly on how we work with cities before coming back to how micromobility can help shaping public spaces. We know that change, especially mobility, is difficult. And shared mobility in particular challenges the status quo of how we allocate, allocate space today. And working closely with cities is, is key to, to like a sustainable reshaping of these public spaces. So if we go to the next slide, I just Uh, yes, this one. Just quickly touching on three areas where we work with cities. One, one thing is local partnerships um, with the private sector and the municipalities to find innovative solutions. Here's an example for Berlin. Um, this picture is taken far outside of the city center. We, with the city and local partnership on the ground, we um, established this charging solution that is now connecting a remote area to public transit in an area that has been struggling actually to get people out of their cars because it was really difficult to get to public transit. Next slide. Another point is data sharing. To reshape mobility and in, in consequence reshape public spaces, cities need data that they, that, they, that they can rely on to make decisions. And in the majority of the cities we operate, we are already today sharing exactly that data with cities. And because the process we're touching on today will take years and decades. And if it's housed, built on concrete data that shows and validates that these changes, it's easier to defend um, the steps cities wants to take. Next slide, please. And lastly, parking solutions. Um, we're providing aggregated usage data to cities so they can identify these areas where parking spaces for micromobility, bikes, cargo bikes, scooters, whatever there might be in the future. And finding better ways to park these vehicles achieves two things, right? It's, it creates an orderly manner for these vehicles to be parked and it makes them accessible to users. On the next slide, I come back to the, 
the future perspective on public spaces. So if we have all this space right now that is hiding because it's occupied by, by private cars, begs the, questions, begs the question, what could we do with all that space if we would free it up? And there are many visions for the future, but I would like to showcase small steps that our city is already taking today, because I think taking the first step and creating momentum is critical to change in the long run. So if we go on the next slide, um, I have a few examples here from cities that are converting car parking spaces already today. First up is Paris. Paris has been converting two and a half thousand parking spaces only in the inner city for bikes and scooters. On the next slide, there's an example from San Francisco. Here it's been reallocated for, for bikes with bike racks. And on the next slide, is one from Berlin that is also for bikes and scooters. And by doing this, cities achieve a few things. Um, by reducing car parking, you're already nudging the people living in the area to think twice of, about getting their own private car. You make space for biking and other sustainable modes of transportation. And in the long run, you save space on a sidewalk for pedestrians. On the next slide, there's another example. Major streets are meant to be used to move things and not to house cars parking there for 23 hours a day. Um, and many cities, especially last year during the, the, the height of the COVID pandemic in Europe, um, took a look and we saw these pop up bike lanes established in, in a, a number of cities. And we see that quite a few of them are actually now tur turned into permanent bike lanes. So here's an example from Berlin, which shows another way how you can use that space to also influence behavior and advocate for a change in behavior. Because the bike lane you see that used to house cars parking there, and now it encouraged people to take the bike or the scooter to get from A to B. And on the next slide, low traffic neighborhoods. Um, here's an example from London. Um, Amsterdam is probably one of the, the most famous examples that started in the 70s of really challenging the status quo, thinking about how they, they could reduce motorized traffic in neighborhoods, um, but also London is one example, but also Vienna um, has been doing this for some, for, for some time now. And the effects are always similar. This increases the quality of life for the people living there and also increases the revenue for shops and restaurants. So there's also economic benefit of doing this. Uh, if you go to the next slide, yeah. Um, change is hard. Changing the status quo is, is really hard and takes time. The picture on the left, I hope you can see it. Uh, this is from Vienna. Vienna has been transforming car parking for scooters, um, but we see still from, from time to time that cars are parking on it and put our scooters to the side. And I think that is always important to keep in mind. Um, we need a holistic approach, how we think about mobility, how we think about public spaces, spaces in cities, because the space is limited and we are all intrinsically motivated and opposed to change. Um, and only by having a holistic concept on how to do it, um, I, I think we will go forward and actually find a, a good way to change mobility so that it works for all people in the city. And coming to my last slide, parking is real estate and hiding. Um, in many cities in, in Europe, you still can park your private car relatively cheaply. Um, for example, in Berlin, where I'm based, you can get a parking space in front of your house for 50 euros for two years. Um, if you look at the housing crisis across many cities, I don't think you will, you will find cheaper real estate than that in any major European city in, or even in, in smaller ones. And we all know the true cost is much higher. Um, as an example, just recently, a parking spot in Hong Kong, a city with very limited space, was auctioned off for 1.3 million US dollars, showing the true cost and the true value of the space, especially in urban centers. Um, so we touch on many options to repurpose public space occupied by car parking today, um, be it for restaurants like this picture shows, low traffic neighborhoods, or just more sustainable means of transportation. Um, reshaping of public spaces starts with how we actually value and put a price on the space on the street today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jakob, for this uh, really interesting presentation. And I think you touched about, uh, upon a couple of very important aspects, such as um, public space is limited, um, the pressure for 
integrating different uses and forms of um, activities is increasing and cities are really challenged to actually uh, find means of catering to all these different demands. From your experience with Lyme, um, also I think Lyme's approach to how to deal with this has changed in the, over the course of the last years. What were your, from your perspective, challenges, but then also perhaps opportunities that you recognized in collaborating with cities to find new infrastructural solutions? Good question. Um, I think it comes down to, as you said, right, the space in the city is limited. Um, there's lots of different, let's call it players in the city. There are pedestrians, we have, we have car parking, uh, we have public transit, we have restaurants. So we're all kind of, I don't want to say fight over the same space, but everybody has an interest in using that space. And there's also just political realities because of how we, how we build cities, giving a lot of space to cars in the past, that it's really difficult for cities to come, um, to move away from that. So I think one of the, one of the challenges is that cities have these emission goals. They have these goals in terms of model split, how they want to change away from it. And looking to Amsterdam, looking co to Copenhagen, and maybe even to Paris now, like Paris has been changing a lot in the last uh, 24 months. There is There are best practices on how to do it, but putting them into action on the ground is really difficult for cities. Um, I, I touched on, on car parking, the, the price for car parking. Um, this is really tough tough mm. thing to do for a politician in, in many cities. So even these small steps, that's why I focused on them. The small steps, the first steps to get a, the ball rolling are really challenging for cities to, to just yeah, get going, advocate for it um, and have like the long breath of seeing it through. Because mm. of course, if you create a new parking spot for e-scooters tomorrow, um, the positive effects of that are not gonna come tomorrow. But the quote unquote negative aspect from the person missing a car parking spot is there from day one. So mm. I think it's a challenge of explaining why this is the right direction to go and then also having um, the long, um, the, the stamina almost to see it through. Mm. Um, perhaps taking up a question that was posed in the Q&A section. Um, I mean, like the, the, the reclaiming of current um, car parks and giving them as um, also parking spaces for bikes and scooters is one aspect, but actually, I mean, this is also a tricky one because you're representing actually a private mobility um, provider or a private mobility company. So what would you say would be a fair rental fee for actually these type of shared user um, shared mobility services um, when it comes to using the public space? Because right now, scooters or bikes are not actually paying for that. Whereas as a, as a driver, if you have your car, you would have to pay for, uh, for uh, car parking. Yeah. And in fact, actually, we, we pay in a, in a number of cities already today um, okay. for, for the space we, we, we use in a city. It's hard for me to come up with a number that is true for, mm. for all markets across, across my region or even in Europe, because mm. how the space is valued is varies from city to city. Um, mm. But I agree, like this space has a value and we have to pay our fair share. Right. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope we have time to then uh, continue the discussion at the very end. For now, I'd like to um, hand over to Tess Tribos and hear her perspective as a representative of a National Road Authority. Thank you, Emilia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Claudia is going to share my presentation. Thank you, Claudia. Let's see. Um, hello. I'm going to talk about uh, not the city, but the space that connects the city, the National Highway. And um, well, I'm going to argue that uh, it, it is not only it is, is it public space, because in, like in most countries, uh, it is uh, tax money that goes into uh, constructing and maintaining national highways. Um, I'm also saying that um, maybe there is a new uh, a new step to take in how we use uh, the highway and what it could be in the future in terms of uh, how we will move around now and 
well, in 30, 50 years, maybe. That's sort of the, the horizon that I'm, that I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. First, I'm going to tell something about Rijksvaterstaat. Um, it's a bit of an odd name that's hard to translate. But what we do, uh, as Emilia already said, is um, maintain the road. Um, we, we also construct new highways, um, but we're also responsible for the water management. And as most people know, we have a lot of water management to do in the Netherlands. Um, we, uh, so it, it varies. We, um, we dredge, um, we, um, we make sure that uh, floodplains are clear, that sluices work, we maintain bridges. Um, we also do traffic management. So it's uh, construction and operation both, really. Next. Um, well, the Netherlands is known for its water, um, for its bikes. Um, we, uh, we have gone, um, as already has been mentioned, through uh, a certain revolution in reclaiming public space in the cities for, for bikes and for pedestrians which started in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and it has led to uh, much more space for certain uh, types of modalities. Um, but the Netherlands actually started claiming space for modalities way, way further back, which is uh, actually what was done by us. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm missing something. Um, and um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. This, this is too far. This is all the way in the, in the back. Okay, well, everyone's getting a, a snapshot of what we will be going through. Um, yes, thank you. Um, the Netherlands is known for, you know, making space for bikes, uh, for uh, maybe even for chain mobility now, for connecting to train stations better. Um, and, uh, and that is something that's still going on. Um, but we are, as a road minister, we are actually looking at another um, shift um, that is perhaps going to change our work drastically. Um, as you can see, we uh, manage quite a large amount of the, the Dutch land mass and water mass. Uh, this 10% doesn't even include um, the, the, the Dutch part of the, of the North Sea, which is maintained and managed by the Rijkswaterstaat as well. And then that area is the size of the Netherlands uh, in, at all. So um, we, we are a, a big, uh, agency. Uh, we are an executive agency, I wanted to also share. So we fall under the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water Management. So um, it's been said in the previous two uh, presentations, but uh, space is politics in a certain way, and uh, we are the executive form of, of that. Um, that being said, we do have our own ideas of what the future could be like. Um, and that is what I'm talking about now to you and what we are working on internally and with our ministry as well. Um, but as you can see, we operate a big amount of space. And so we feel we have a responsibility to think ahead and think in the best interest of, uh, of everyone that uses our infrastructure in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. Soon it will be a hundred years since we first constructed the first highway in the Netherlands. But we've been uh, managing waterways way, way, way before that. So we are a very old agency and we have been uh, working in, uh, in very different uh, political settings, um, as you can see from the date, um, but also in different capacities. So we started out managing waterways solely. And when the time came to um, think about a national road uh, network, 
with the arrival of the private car, um, quite naturally, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Space um, appointed us to this task. Uh, so we, we had to change internally as well in terms of the expertise we had and needed to build up uh, to not only manage road uh, waterways, but also start managing and building roadways. Next slide. Um, it was a novelty. Uh, so in 1973, we had our first roadway constructed, a short stretch uh, of 15 kilometers. And um, it, we, uh, we build out this network really fast. Uh, so it, it's not, this is not even a hundred years ago and our work has changed drastically uh, since this moment. And, um, and I'm going to argue that it will again, going towards something that I for now call a multimodal highway. Next slide. So still talking a little bit about where we come from as a road, uh, road administrator. In 1927, you can see the plan for uh, for the Netherlands and for its roadway network. Uh, note that Flevoland wasn't constructed yet, the big polder, and the Afslagdijk wasn't built yet um, or even conceived. Um, so those connections are not there, but are there now in the in the center uh, plan for the Netherlands. And as you can see, the, the plan pretty much is exactly how we have built it out with some additional connections, some small uh, way arounds because of um, land administration issues. Um, and now we, but also our politicians agree that our road network is done. There is very little space left in the Netherlands to build more roads. Looking at it from a um, capacity perspective, um, from a management perspective, we would actually uh, consider to build more roads because there is demand for it. And this is how we've been building our network for the last five centuries, uh, no, five decades. When the demand grew, we built more roads. And now that trend has come to a stop and we're reconsidering how we want to use this network that we have. We are more hesitant now to build, build more of it and um, build barriers in our land by doing so. Um, and now we're thinking about what, what, how could we use this, this network to integrate it better in the other infrastructure networks that we have? How can we use uh, highways that are not just going around cities, but that are connected to cities better. So currently, and that's the final uh, image, we have uh, large amounts of infrastructure and space that you can only access when you are in a motorized vehicle. And you're actually, there's a penalty for accessing, access, accessing it without it. Next slide which is, I imagine, quite a global phenomenon to be penalized for walking over a highway. So we're want, we want to, as a road administrator, we want to position ourselves um, for what our network could be like and how we would want to use it in the future, not just for a passenger transport, but also for a freight. Next slide. What we started doing is talking to a lot of local um, local authorities, um, uh, to companies who are in uh, the business of providing mobility solutions. Um, and we talk a lot with, particularly with municipalities, about their urbanization strategies. Um, globally, uh, there is a shortage of housing and the Netherlands is no exception. So or the political trend now is to find building ground as fast as possible and start building more residential uh, areas. 
this has a direct effect on on the networks that we operate. So we want to be included in in those plans and think think with local authorities and with municipalities what are good options and what are options that um, pr give more pressure to the network, considering private vehicles uh, uh, next to um, connection to other uh, more public uh, sol transport solutions. Um, in the Netherlands, at least, it's easier to build in the polder and just make a road and, it, and connect it to the highway and um, create accessibility through that solution, then to find this niche spot and with all kinds of regulation and um, environmental laws within the city or next to existing um, public transport because it's just more valuable. Um, and so it's harder to build there. It's easy to build where you know, there's not so much around. Um, but then you're building uh, for people that need a car. And funny enough, because we are very much known as the, uh, the agency that uh, is there for cars, we're trying to shift that image and try to talk to uh, our own people and people that we work with in, in municipalities to think with them about a more multimodal solution. Next slide, please. So, I feel I have a little time left, so I'm going to briefly mention some of these outcomes of these talks. So it would be great, maybe three more minutes? Yeah, sure. So um, in some instances, like Eindhoven, the, the ring, the highway ring around, wasn't really considered in their uh, development of the city and of uh, more um, areas where they wanted to build houses. So we brought that perspective along when we started talking to them. And uh, it was very constructive and, um, and, and they valued our, our, our expertise and our perspective. Next slide. In Tilburg Waldijk, um, there's a huge um, recreational park that generates a lot of trips um, by car typically. And uh, we talked to them about the options uh, and the obstructions. There was there is no possibility to widen this road, even though it's only two way lanes both ways. Um, so we talked to them about building out a, a regional bicycling uh, network, which is something that Rijkswaterstaat has no authority over. We don't uh, we don't manage the bicycle infrastructure that's done on the municipality scale. And uh, nonetheless, to solve the problem that we were having on our highway, we had to talk about a very different mode of transport to to make this area uh, not congested, um, because there's also a lot of freight going over that road. Next. And Rotterdam, The Hague, uh, where there is a lot of freight transport and so it's of enormous interest uh, on a national level. We have two main ports there uh, that we need to uh, have accessible now and in the future. One of the biggest challenges is that, for, particularly in Rotterdam, the, um, the, the ring of highway around it is um, sort of unwrapped in, in the city as it grew bigger. And so most of those trips on the highway are actually local. And those highway connections also are required for the movement of freight. Um, so that's a really difficult issue that we, um, that we have addressed together with the municipality and, uh, and the ministry. Um, and now that we've gotten to this, uh, this you know, the, the issues are now clearly on the table. And it's much, much easier to come up with an integral solution that works for everyone. That's the last slide, I think. Yeah. So the view that we have for the highway is that somehow we want to break it open and want to connect it better to the city uh, to facilitate a different form of passenger transport and to facilitate a different form of freight transport. 
Next slide, please. Um, what we see is that there will be more target groups that we want to facilitate. There's going to be a different balance between freight and passengers. Uh, we see chain mobility as something that is necessary to uh, keep the accessibility level that we've been getting, that we've gotten used to over the last couple of decades, uh, while, you know, densifying our city and making more trips has been said before, even if you're teleworking, you still make different kinds of trips. And we see the multimodal highway as a place rather than a space, which it is kind of now. And what we do see is that the perfect car won't go away just yet, definitely not for trips longer than 10 kilometers. And, uh, but we are in agreement that for trips under 10 kilometers, the private car should be less of an option. Final slide. So the highway for most people is some, is some place that you don't go without a car. And we think that in the future it will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tess. I think this was an extremely interesting um, presentation because it's something that perhaps we don't even think about or associate with public space particularly. And I think um, what you point out um, quite aptly is that as a country that has actually reached its capacity of spatial availability in terms of how much the, the road network can grow and especially like the highway network can grow, is that we need new means of increasing efficiency. And one go-to pathway very fast is usually technology. How can we improve cars? How can we improve, you know, connectivity between cars, automation? I guess we'll uh, talk about this in a few minutes. Um, but what you actually juxtapose with these sort of technological fixes is we need a radical reconsideration of how we think these spaces and not mm -hmm. just infrastructural spaces for traffic and mobility, but actually also opening those up for um, considering them as a place. This is quite a bold vision. Um, <laughs> and I think it's interesting that you um, being a representative of the Reichswaterstadt is actually thinking about these topics how would you um, describe your experiences of having these dialogues and conversations about reconsidering what the highway stands for in the Netherlands, if you talk about internally, but then also with municipalities and different actors involved? Yeah, this is a good question. It's hard to get this message across. It's easier to talk to people who work in design or you know who are used to thinking outside of the box. We our agency consists mostly of engineers, of which I am one. Um, but I, it, it is my job to think out of the box and think ahead. Um, so we have we have that capacity within our agency, but most of us are uh, are executive engineers. So they construct, they build projects. Um, they don't have time to rethink their scope, uh, which is in most cases a good thing. So there's um it's not something that's picked up easily but mm, we are used to innovating or public space the dutch uh the dutch street is a very common concept now worldwide where you know you have separated spaces for bikes and pedestrians and a little little lane for a car uh if need be um so that's that kind of concept is something that we in a different form want to apply to the highway. So it's not that new in the sense that we have re rethought our public space and we have rethought our infrastructure so we can do it again. Um, but yeah, um, those dialogues um, are, are, are plenty because you know every, every time you talk to people, you get a different part of your idea across and yes there are many obstacles so you need to go talk through all of them and uh, yeah rome wasn't built in a day um if you would paint a picture of what the highway could or we could imagine the highway in maybe 10 20 30 uh, years from now um how would you see the spatial divisions between different modes 
are you asking for like a profile of the highway is it like that which type of modes would you see oh i see about the multimodal highway which modes would you see to to share yeah. that space uh well in it's going to be a little bit different than the the the, the regular uh, neighborhood street in the netherlands because the, the challenge the, the technical challenge with the highway is that you have the big speed differences the bigger the difference between different vehicles the more dangerous it is and we are also responsible for road safety so this will be quite experimental for the first 10 years and to figure out how we're going to do it we're actually having we have uh, commissioned uh, an, a design exercise to you know formulate some first ideas um, how hubs would be integrated how we can utilize space that we actually already have in a better way under highways next to highways we have a lot of land reservations uh, that are within or um, that are in our, not in our custody, but in our um, part of what we maintain. Um, but what we see is um, diff so those different groups that you ask about. Um, so there won't be bikes probably on a highway, but uh, what we do see is that bicycle facilities or electrical bike facilities could be better integrated with uh, with the space very close to a highway. Um, technology, as you mentioned, won't may probably not be in, in our vision the solution, but it will help because if we have cleaner cars and uh, quieter cars, it is more pleasant to live or be next to a highway where there's a lot of them driving. So that would change the direct environment of a highway drastically, and it would make it more palatable to have a bus rapid transit bus stop right next to the highway with a bay, and you just you know you come. How we we have a we have an idea about how you arrive at the hop on the on the ground floor. You take the elevator up to the highway because we have a lot of highways that are elevated in the Netherlands. And uh, you just you know hang out there for a minute or two, and then the bus rapid the bus rapid no the rapid bus will just stop by and um, and pick you up and is has its you know its own lane for it probably are two hundred meters to get to pick up speed again, and then safely can can move into the rest of the of the vehicles. There will be much more uh, shared cars. Uh, sh uh, uh, yeah, shared cars on the road that need a space to be parked, uh, but that won't be there for long because many people will use it. So um, it's a different kind of parking that we're looking at. Maybe we can facilitate that. That's those are things that we're that we're thinking about because we have the space. We just don't have the mandate yet to do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Tess. I think that's a great um, bridge, actually, to our next presentation, which is addressing um, what the future could be of automated vehicles. And interestingly enough, Agnes will also talk about um, on which parts of the street networks this technology is more feasible right now. And perhaps that also adds another level of complexity that we need to think of when we want to diversify mobility spaces in the future. Atlas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks uh, for the intro, Emilia. Hello also from my side. Um, I'm Agelos Zeteropoulos, as Emilia mentioned, um, working at the Future Lab Institute for Transportation System Planning in Vienna at the Te Technical University of Vienna. My presentation today will be uh, on the topic of um, compatibility of automated vehicles and street spaces. And I will present some results of an analysis from Vienna, Austria. Uh, but first, um, let's have an overview of the presentation today. I will first give a short introduction, um, then present the methods applied within the analysis, and then I will come to the results, and at the end I give a short conclusion. So next slide, please. 
Yeah, so when we're looking at studies, um, I think there are a lot of studies on the impacts of automated ve uh, vehicles um, recently on travel behavior. And when we look at th those studies and the results of those studies, they mostly indicate an increase in traffic um, volume. So vehicle miles traveled um, due to automated vehicles. But mm, the studies were mostly conducted on a citywide. Um, there was no focus so far on changes within different street spaces um, within, within the city. Um, but the street spaces are subject to a wide range of competing usage demand. And we ha heard it already in the, um, in, the, in the first presentation today that it, street spaces do, do not only consist of the traffic function, but are also places for people to move, stroll, sit or, sit or play. And what is important to um, uh, acknowledge here is that the needs between traffic function on the one hand, so the needs of the motor vehicles, um, um, but also um, and, and the needs of the other road users, uh, so pedestrians, cyclists, people who want to move or uh, sit in the street, way, street space are only reasonable until a certain limit. And, and, uh, and above this limit, um, this is no longer compatible with the needs of other road users. So the main question within the analysis was, um, how compatible uh, are automated vehicles in different street spaces due to changes in traffic volume? Um, next slide, please. So how was the analysis conducted? Um, in total, three different scenarios were simulated using um, the so-called MATSIM model. It's a multi-agent transport simulation model, an agent-based si uh, simulation model, and um, these, these simulations were, were done for the whole street net network of uh, Vienna, Austria. And, um, and um, so besides the reference scenario um, in which the actual mobility within the city um, was modeled, three scenarios with AVs were modeled. One and two um, um, consisted of um, shared automated vehicles. Um, and in scenario one, shared automated vehicles within, uh, with a door-to-door -door service were modeled. And in scenario two, shared automated vehicles stopping only at existing bus stops um, um, were simulated. Whereas in scenario three, um, this, this automation of all current private vehicles, um, also including a um, plus 25% utility increase in Matsim, and because the time in the vehicle can be used for other activities and not uh, only for driving anymore, and uh, also a uh, capacity increase because there are shorter gaps between vehicles possible. So basically these were the three scenarios that were modeled. And um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, besides the simulation um, uh, that was conducted using Matsim, also an assessment of the compatibility was conducted. And this was done in mainly uh, three steps. So the first step was that um, a maximum compatible traffic volume in terms of the maximum number of vehicles per hour at peak hour for each street section of the street network in. And, and this was done based on um, different area types, the age of buildings, zoning categories, and the number of shops and businesses. And you see also in the map then uh, at the end, um, five different area categories have been distinguished. Uh, so the city center in red and also industrial areas um, and motorways um, and the outskirts or low density residential areas. And for, the, for each of these um, area types, and for, for a first maximum compatible um, traffic volume was determined. So next slide, please. Yeah, and um, based on that, in the second step, um, the, the determined maximum compatible traffic volume was further adapted based on um, different characteristics of, of the street sections because um, the, 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 the street sections within these area um, categories uh, are clearly different from each other or can, can vary. And um, characteristics that were used were the distribution of space. You can already uh, also see that in, in the maps on the right. Um, then use of pedestrian and cycle, vehicle traffic, crossing needs, green and design elements, and crossability. And based on these characteristics, um, this the the the, um, the maximum um, uh, traffic traffic volume um, um, determined before was adapted, and also a weighting of the criteria was done um, to have an, have such an adapted um, uh, maximum compatible traffic volume for each street section. So next slide, please. 
And lastly, the, the third step was um, to, um, uh, in, the, in the third step, uh, maximum traffic volume and the adapted maximum tra compatible traffic volume was done. And this was done um, for the reference scenario, of course, but also for all scenarios with, um, with the automated vehicles. And on the right side, you see how it um, was basically done. Um, and um, yeah, based on that, um, we, let's have a look at the, at the results in the next slide. Um, so first here you can see um, the street level changes in traffic volume at peak hour for all scenarios with automated vehicles. Um, and you see for both scenarios um, with, auto, um, with shared automated vehicles on the top, um, you see an increase in, in red, you see an increase in, in of vehicles at peak hour in the inner city parts especially. Um, um, and um, especially for scenario two on the top right, you see um, a decrease also um, uh, of vehicles at peak hour in the outskirts, for example, in the north northeastern part of, of Vienna, um, there are also um, a decrease of vehicles observable. In contrast um, to that, uh, for scenario three, um, you see um, uh, for private automated vehicles, you see an increase at peak hour at higher at the higher level street network. So, for example, primary roads, but also um, motorways. And based on that, on the next slide, um, we will see also the results. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we see also the results on the, uh, on, the, on the changes in compatibility uh, of the street spaces. So first of all, on the top left, the, the, the assessment of co the compatibility, compatibility was done for the reference scenario. And you see that the actual um, traffic volume in the reference scenario is mostly uh, especially in the inner parts of the city, but also um, on, on the primary roads, of course, not compatible with the needs of surrounding users uh, in the higher level street network. And um, But when you look at the results and on the other changes of com in the compatibility uh, in the three scenarios with AVs, so the other um, um, three um, maps on the right, you see that all scenarios um, with AVs show lower levels of compatib com contab compatibility um, um, indicated in red um, um, in comparison to the reference scenario, especially in the inner city. So the core of the city uh, is... But you can also see an improvement in compatibility along the streets in the outskirts, for example, in, in uh, especially in scenario two. Yeah, so next, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, similar results are also observable when we only look at the, at the streets that were not compati compatible um, in the refer already in the reference scenario. So you see uh, for refer for scenarios with SAVs, um, the two to on top of the um, on the right, you see an increase of vehicles, um, um, especially only in the um, eastern and southern part of Vienna. But in contrast to that, um, for scenario three with private automated vehicles, you see um, increases in traffic volume in the already and um, not comp completely not non compatible streets, um, especially at the higher level street networks or primary roads um, mm. and, um, and and motorways and um, yeah just major roads and you see that there is an even higher non compatibility and further increasing of the separating effects or barrier effects of such streets that are all already today um, barrier effects, uh, uh, barrier, barriers in the, in, in the street, in the street, uh, in the city. And um, therefore, um, you see that with private automated vehicles, um, this, is, this would, would, be, would further increase. So next slide, please. So, uh, so what to conclude on the basis of the results? So first of all, of course, um, and this was also conducted here, we need spatially different strategies for the implementation of AVs in the future. So there is not uh, one for, for all solution, but we need uh, um, different st strategies, especially to um, different spatial aspects as the public spaces um, uh, are uh, different or, um, uh, in the cities. So for, for street space in areas in the outskirts, um, there is a, uh, a the sens sensibility towards a further increase of vehicles um, to, due to um, automated vehicles is lower and conflict less with other and users in the inner city in, a, in the inner parts of the city than in the inner parts of the city and uh, implementing um, shared automated vehicles 
in addition to public transport may decrease also traffic in these areas and thus um, may, might be interesting for cities to consider. However, um, for street spaces in which the current traffic volume um, at peak hour is already not compatible with the user demands and especially in inner city areas, AVs could also induce uh, traffic volumes and street spaces should uh, rather designed to be more compatible with the needs of pedestrian cyclists. For example, by the implementation of walking and cycling infrastructure, we had a lot of that um, before in the, um, in the um, presentations before. And it should also be taking account that uh, there was no consideration of induced traffic volume due to no new user groups. Um, and this would mean even higher increases in um, vehicle miles traveled are possible. And this um, uh, just um, increases the need for such um, implementation strategy, tra strategies, um, or at least um, the implementation of automated vehicles should be linked to these, these measures. And um, to conclude, lastly, um, analysis that um, take into account the spatial heterogeneity in cities. And this is not only uh, with regard to the, com com to the topic of compatibility, uh, as um, presented here, but also with regard to the technical infrastructure suitability of street spaces for AVs. So uh, we, we know that um, street spaces also um, mean a different complexity for automated driving systems. So um, reflect the presentation before, of course, the motorways, except of the, the speed, are um, uh, really suitable for automated vehicles. But there are other street spaces in cities, especially um, residential areas um, with uh, a lot of children, is, uh, et cetera, where the complexity of automated driving system is. And therefore, also from this per perspective, we need um, spatially different strategies for the implementation of AVs in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. If you, um, next slide. If you um, want to have further information, this, the results are basically published in the paper um, uh, recently. Um, you should just you could have a look and um, then thank you um, next slide thank you um, and happy to answer your question thank you very much uh, Agelos uh, perhaps a quick question uh, that uh, Martin Schmidt from Graz posted uh, he was asking more details about the second scenario where sh shared automated vehicles were modeled uh, why did um, the volume, traffic volume decrease, especially in the outer, uh, in the outskirts. Yeah, um, yeah, um, the, it, it, it decreases because um, um, people just shifted to um, the, the shared automated vehicle the bus stops because it provided a better uh, traffic solution than before, I think, um, in the in the sim simulations. And um, this is basically the case because I think um, at these um, areas in Vienna, the, the current public transport is not that, not that good and um, the shared automated vehicles um, could provide here an additional service or this was the scenario and this was the case that uh, the uh, people shifted from, from um, motor, motor vehicles or private motor vehicles to public transport here in these areas especially. Right. And perhaps just a, um, a review, like the, the what are the scenarios that were considered? It was um, shared automated vehicles as shuttle buses or uh, private automated vehicles, right? Because that was one of the questions. Yeah. So it was very sort of applied or short term um, use cases, not long term visions. Um, then thank you very much. I'd like to move on then to share the final presentation, actually, which I will hold and that um, builds on what Agalos just presented. Um, it was the second part of a um, joint collaboration we did with the city of Vienna, um, talking about how these type of um, traffic demand changes, but then also spatially impact uh, street designs. Um, it's important to note here actually that um, integrated analysis of how AVs, automated vehicles, can impact street designs is actually something that is still lacking. So uh, the majority of modeling and analysis looks at exactly these sort of traffic issues, but um, it less often also takes into account what are the impacts on street life, what are the impacts on infrastructure requirements, and also on urban form. And to get a better understanding of how this could pan out in the city of Vienna, um, building on the modeling that Agilos just uh, presented, 
we decided to zoom in to three different neighborhoods of the city and look at streets that uh, differ in terms of land use and also a tight street typology. What we chose to look at in particular is first an inner city commercial street, second, a suburban arterial with a tramway, and then third, an industrial access street. By doing that, we actually built on previous studies which showed that the implications of AV, as Aguilos also mentioned, will occur unevenly across cities, that is, affect some neighborhoods um, more than others. Um, and every mode actually poses functional demands on a street. Um, and this is what we then looked at when it comes to how AVs could actually impact the change in public spaces, because um, these might not be the first order effects, but they are the ripple effect or the second order effect that occur once traffic demand changes and also alterations to the mobility system have been done. And in the specific case, we looked at, on the one hand, the demand for pickup and drop off uh, spaces that uh, will increase also, especially when it comes to the reduction of privately owned uh, cars and an increase in shared vehicles, and then also um, short-term parking uh, demand, which might occur um, equally. Um, there are two questions that then tie into these type of demands. One is how are pickup and drop-off areas um, organized and integrated into public space? And then secondly, to what extent can we actually uh, repurpose existing street space and also car parking that was addressed in the earlier uh, visions already um, for public use? And this is actually a critical question that is very often um, brought up when it comes to automated vehicles because it's considered the sort of the advantage, the spatial advantage that they could entail if traffic efficiency actually increases. Um, the assumption though that it sort of builds upon is that these vehicles will be shared because the sharing aspect um, causes the spatial efficiency a lot more than just the mere automation of the of the of the vehicles. So there are um, three different variables that we actually looked at in order to delineate how spatial change can, um, uh, can happen or occur. On the one hand, we looked at the passenger interactions per hour, which sort of reveal in which areas of a streetscape um, there is the highest demand um, of cur for curb space. So also whether or not the demand is concentrated or spaced out along a street. Um, secondly, we looked at uh, how uh, loading zones would need to be dimensioned. So to, in what extent is, um, is pickup and drop off areas or are pickup and drop off areas necessary? Again, uh, referring to the peak hour demand. Um, and then thirdly, we looked at the demand for short term parking, um, which might occur um, if there are waiting times between different passenger requests. So that is especially the case if cities decide to actually curb deadheading, meaning that cities would try to reduce the amount of empty vehicles cruising in traffic and thereby actually um, causing environmental harm. So I will take the um, inner city commercial street um, as an example in order to illustrate how we integrated the assessment of um, traffic land use compa compa uh, compatibility with um, the functional demands that may arise. And what we did in order to uh, develop a spatial design strategy is to actually also consider what local development goals of the city of Vienna are when it comes to um, transforming public spaces, but then also when it comes to parking policy. And this is exactly because, as has been also mentioned before, we would wanted to stress that whether or not public spaces with AVs will change to the better, um, has to do with the policies in place, has to do with the priorities of municipal governments and planning institutions. So what we designed then, zooming in really on the street level, are not so much um, the one ideal futures as space should be, but actually sort of we opened this um, um, a space of, um, of possibility, uh, possibilities of different alternatives, depending on what the policies are. First, what we see on the left hand, for example, when it comes to integrating pickup and drop off areas, there could be bays which are just next to the curb space. 
but and the positive effect of such base would be that they would reduce negative impacts in traffic and improve safe interaction between different uh, participants. On the other hand, it could actually also make those type of services more attractive. So what the right side shows is perhaps a solution that is less attractive when it comes to traffic because um, vehicles stopping on the street itself could um, increase congestion. However, it could actually also reduce the uh, how attractive private services um, would be relative, for example, to active mobility and relative to transit, which is an important aspect to consider um, whether or not AVs will actually conflict with transit. Um, the second sort of pathway of transformation that we looked at is again uh, parking. And then here as well, you see on the left side, of course, short-term parking that might uh, be relevant in the future as well can be uh, provided on street as it is today. However, it would actually not change how vast the spatial demand is right now and, and um, how much space is actually allocated to stationary traffic. An alternative strategy would actually be to mobilize existing vacancies in garages, in uh, parking facilities, and integrate those, um, those uh, with um, also fleet um, services, with um, charging stations, with, um, with maintenance opportunities, uh, and, and create um, so-called uh, so mobility hubs. The third pathway for transformation is that of how can how can the permeability and the walkability of street spaces be actually facilitated. And on the one hand, of course, the main sort of subject and it has been also uh, addressed in the, uh, in the chat is um, the reduction of speed, but then there are also different design solutions. So there, for example, can be you can pull in the, the edges um, of the of the sidewalk sidewalks in order to reduce um, the speed and also in, improve uh, the public space and also the con uh, visual connectivity of uh, different sites. But you can also implement, for example, shared street spaces, which is a different approach to reduce um, the, the hierarchy between, between different modes and actually enhance the sense of public space and place. So what are the learnings for cities if we do these type of integrated um, analyses uh, and why is it important to do so? Um, on the one hand, assessments like this can inform what the trade-offs are of a system change. And this has been also, um, I think, uh, shown quite well in what Agilas presented is that the technology in itself will not fix the problems. Um, secondly, these assessments can help in selecting which are the adequate operational conditions and also the areas for new services. So actually, rather than saying um, we implement them wherever it's technically feasible, we actually say we, where are the areas where uh, these new services can actually provide a solution to the problems we as cities currently have. And then thirdly, um, these type of integrated assessments help can help cities to develop and understand which proactive policy measures are necessary in order to transform urban spaces and public spaces um, to become more accessible, sustainable, and lively public spaces. Um, to just pin this down a bit more concretely is that there are a number of different policy considerations that cities can already make today before AVs um, are being, um, you know, ready uh, to be implemented. On the one hand, of course, incentivizing measures for higher vehicle, vehicle occupancy rates need to be put in place um, in order to really um, reach that aspect of shared amount of vehicle miles traveled. Um, there needs to be a citywide classification of road network um, according to the traffic speeds, but then also considering exactly what Agalos was pointing out, the adjacent land use and demand of land uses um, for, for spatial functions. And the third aspect is then also prioritizing in specific areas, active mobility and transit, rather than saying that new modes um, can come in and then maybe cannibalize um, the diversity of, of, the, of mobilities. And the last, lastly, what is important to say is um, that we need policy measures to curb the environmental impacts of deadheading, which is occurring today already, with um, with ride pooling options actually on the rise. 
So with this, I'd like to also conclude with the final presentation. And perhaps if we have a couple more minutes, um, ask my fellow uh, panelists to join me again on stage and, um, and wrap for a short wrap up um, session. Thank you so much for all of your perspectives. I think it was a beautiful sort of um, span of what we need to think of. Um, yesterday, there was the question in one of the sessions, um, how long will changes that we have seen in the past year last? You know, what are the, what are the opportunities actually to really have a lasting transformation that we're sort of sketching in our visions? Um, I would like to ask you in that sense, um, what are your, uh, how well do you see these sort of visions feasible? What are the opportunities um, uh, ahead of us to actually create this momentum necessary to, to have a transformation happening? Um, Sabina, maybe you would like to start. Mm, thank you for, for, this, for this nice question. Actually, um, it's funny, I had some similar discussion yesterday. Um, well, what I think is it's totally possible that we size this moment and I think we did an important first step through um, having these discussions and talking about it and trying to convince people that have not thought about it before and uh, share our opinions. Of course, in this, in this session that we are in now, but I, I mean it more broadly, having a discussion with our colleagues and our friends and families and talk about it to make it more, make people more aware of these chances that we have within this situation we are. So, I, I, of course, I cannot um, really have a concrete idea of how long it will take, but I'm, I'm super optimistic that we will be able to to change something in a positive way. And I think also, sorry, one more, one more sentence. Um, I think also that these um, examples that we saw of cities that had temporary, um, temporary bike lanes, like the example from Berlin, but also this example that I showed that have ten had temporary actions that they did already implement in a more permanent way, they are showing us the way. Thank you. Um, Jakob, how do you see our way ahead? Yeah, um, I don't think necessarily that what we saw last year were completely new trends. Um, I think the trends were there already, but they got accelerated by this situation we're in last year. So I think it was inevitable that more cities think about better biking infrastructure, reducing car parking. I think that was already on the horizon due to the, just the general trends, climate change, of urbanization. So it would have happened eventually. And I think now we just pulled it forwards, at least the first step, a couple of years. Um, in terms of how long it's gonna change, how long it's gonna take to see like real change, lasting change, that's a good question. I, I think usually people tend to overestimate the change that can happen in two years and underestimate the change that can happen in 10 years. So mm -hmm. I think if we would come back in 10 years, I, I feel comfortable saying that cities in Europe or worldwide will see, will look like a lot different. Thank you. Tess, perhaps uh, from your perspective, um, we also in advance talked about, you know, the sort of institutional change that needs to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, to actually bring about uh, these steps. Um, how how do you see that? How do you see the the possibility of um, um, creating a shift in the mindsets from the different stakeholders? I I think we have we we can look back and, and see lasting change in that respect. We have many of us have re-evaluated their lives, how long they are in a car, what they could do with all that time if they weren't. Um, and 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 this has this has affected policymakers as well. Um, so yeah, working for the government, I, I see um, I see that we as um, as um, public servants are you know anticipating these changes and anticipating the mindset that must be present in in most of our 
of, of the people in our country. So, and prob probably in other countries as well. Um, so, yeah, I would say that we have already achieved a, a lasting change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Agalos, uh, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, I think um, often automated vehicles. Yeah, so. but from the perspective of automated vehicles, is it is to say that um, of course maybe um, automated vehicles are a little bit ahead. So if we see first um, um, uh, testings and um, operations in parts of the world, but you have to keep in mind that this, um, uh, today already today you um, set the boundaries for this development. So um, if you invest in cycling infrastructure, if you invest in uh, in in pedestrian infrastructure in the in the city center, for example, then there is maybe no need for automated sh shuttles that um, further increase uh, vehicle miles traveled. And um, what is also important is that, um, for example, when you look at the solutions um, re with regard to automated vehicles. It's not not only about the technology. It's also also about the the um, um, operation itself. How to integrate it in the in the current tra transport system. And this is something that it can do. This is not something you can wait. You have to wait for the technology, but you can you can look at and in this multiple um, model perspective how to integrate the services today. And when it comes to um, uh, um, automated vehicles. Um, way better for public transport, for example, but just do it today, um, make it and set the because you are um, also um, um, doing the development and, and setting the um, boundaries for the development. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for your really inspiring presentations today. Thank you also to everybody who joined in to listen and who posed questions. I thought I think it was a very sort of uh, engaging morning session. Um, and perhaps uh, the, as a key takeaway, yes, there is lots to still be done. I think there are lots of great ideas and visions out there um, and also sort of um, pathways to go about. And it takes all of us to actually contribute um, to create that shift and the transformation we'd like to see. So I uh, wish you um, a great next session and uh, thank you again and bye bye.